Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. Today, we have Dr. Steve Bierman joining us, and he is truly an expert on the art of language and how we communicate with our patients. A uh, favorite subject of mine. I think we're very lucky to have Steve as a teacher uh, in our programs. He's one of the, I think, most uh, powerful uh, explainers of the power of ideas and how that can either impact uh, the possibility of healing or work against it. And there are going to be tips for you about what you can do if you do feel like you might have gotten hexed, how to mitigate that. So let's welcome Steve. Dr. Steve Bierman received his MD from Northwestern University School of Medicine and worked for nearly 20 years as an emergency physician at Scripps Memorial Hospital in Encinitas. He became well known for performing painless injections and laceration repairs, and even reducing the pain of childbirth. In private practice, Dr. Bierman learned the importance of communication when addressing autoimmune diseases, depression, and cancer. Dr. Bierman teaches how we can focus the power of ideas to access our healer within. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. And one of the things I'd uh, like to ask is that you have a uh, concern that patients can be inadvertently harmed during typical communications that are embedded in the doctor-patient encounter. How did you first became aware of this? It was uh, a gradual learning, actually. And it connected to my uh, early studies of hypnosis. I have to say this may be surprising. Also, some early readings of uh, books by Dr. Weil and, and others. Um, in particular, I remember well a, a chapter on uh, placebo and health and healing that had a profound effect on me. Um, but as I got deeper and deeper into uh, clinical hypnosis, of course, I realized through that the importance of crafting my messages clearly and the impact of ideas on health and healing. And uh, initially, it, it wasn't clear to me that the words of a physician outside of uh, trance could have a pr profound impact. But what happened to me was I was working in the emergency room, and over time, it became busier and busier. And I ultimately did not have time to do formal trance inductions. So I abandoned that aspect of the technique and uh, kept closely to the careful language that I had learned. And by uh, happenstance, patient after patient, I realized that uh, trance was just a, a, a response I could induce and that my authority but by, by virtue of the patient's sense of helplessness and dependency and their attribution of that authority to me gave me a hypnotic influence as it does all doctors. And so uh, I began hearing, you know, through the curtain, things other doctors were saying or in my own mind, things that I might have said and realizing, no, that's, that's dangerous, that can do harm and then it's it's a small jump from that to nocebo effects and uh, realizing that inadvertently, now, I don't think any of this is really intended, of course, um, but inadvertently, doctors often do a lot of harm because they don't realize the hypnotic influence of their words. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and before we start unpacking it, um, I want to turn to Andy. Andy, you have also uh, spoken about how formative uh, hypnosis training was for you. And of course, uh, the art of medicine, the art of using language well has always been a part of your conception of integrative medicine. Yes, and I think Steve and I have similar backgrounds and interests. Uh, I took a course in clinical hypnosis uh, after I got out of my clinical training, one of the best courses I've ever taken. And uh, But I've always been fascinated by the power of words 
by the placebo response and how that is so misunderstood in medicine and the inverse of that sometimes called the nocebo response you know negative effects produced through the mind body connection and i have just collected in the course of my practice many instances in which uh, doctors actually steve occasionally it is done intentionally that's rare but it happens but mostly unconsciously hex patients and i wrote about medical hexing in in health and healing and i've seen just some spectacular examples of that andy would you give one example because um, people <clears throat> may not recognize what medical hexing is well, this is a very glaring example that you've heard me tell before. Uh, some years ago, I had a patient, a middle-aged woman from Helsinki, uh, who came to Tucson to spend some time at Canyon Ranch. She had a fairly early diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. She was very depressed. Uh, she came in the winter and in the course of staying here, brightened up considerably, I think just being in the sunshine and an agreeable mm -hmm. climate. But uh, we had several meetings. And at one point she said, you wouldn't believe what that doctor did to me in Helsinki. She was at the main university hospital. And she said, when he gave her the diagnosis, she was having some weakness uh, of multiple sclerosis. He said, wait here a minute. He went out and brought a wheelchair in and asked her to sit in the wheelchair. And she said, why should I sit in the wheelchair? He said he wanted her to get a wheelchair and sit in it for an hour a day to practice for the time when she would be disabled. Wow. Wow. That, that's like a horrific example. Steve, one of the things you talk about is there is a way in which we can mitigate the effects of that kind of medical hexing. Can you talk about what Andy could have said to that woman or what you would have said to that woman? <laughs> well, sure. It, it depends on understanding two simple things, really. The nature of our knowledge, the kind of knowledge we as physicians have, which is fundamentally statistical or anecdotal, but never relates directly to the patient who sits before you. That's one thing. And the other is the, the sheer fallacy of prophecy. Um, which we should all really be instructed on in medical school. Um, I, I tell my patients frequently, when, when you feel uh, a hex coming at you. <laughs> Is there a certain sens <laughs> sensation that they get? <laughs> yeah. You feel it. You, you, you're instinctively aware that potential damage is being done. Uh, when you feel that, um, recite... The mantra I've given you, which is, you don't know me, you don't know me, but also understand that the guy or, or uh, woman who's telling you that can't predict their own future, their own tomorrow. So how possibly could they predict yours? And, and so it's understanding the nature of our knowledge and that we really can't predict no matter what because things will always change in the future. A cure for what you think is incurable will be found tomorrow in some cases. Once you have that as your mindset, it becomes much more easy to say it right. I've read um, something you wrote where every word matters. And um, even something as simple as when you're greeting a patient, when you're saying goodbye to a patient, you can infuse those greetings with um, suggestions that the patient will do well. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I teach that your greeting, for example, is your first opportunity to establish rapport. I mean rapport in a tight sort of methodological way that relates to hypnotic method. It's, a, it's an imitative technique. Um, and it empowers your words uh, even greater. But it's also your first opportunity to set fear and anxiety aside. Mm -hmm. so for example, in the emergency room, uh, I might say, I see you're bleeding. That must have been really scary, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And their assent to that puts it in the past. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Right? At the same time, I'll be doing other things, breathing with them, matching my vocal energy with them, and so forth, to, to tighten the rapport and, and make uh, a greater oneness between the two of us. In terms of goodbyes, that's your last opportunity in that session anyway, to implant a therapeutic suggestion. 
So instead of saying to someone, as is, is frequently done, um, well, you just have to go home and tough it out. Uh, it'll take a week or two to get better. Call me if you're not better in two weeks. There's a lot, there's a lot of negativity in that. You might say something like this. You know, some people might take up to a week. On the other hand, I have patients, perhaps very much like you, who get well in, in a day or two. Why don't you call me tomorrow? Let me know how well you feel. Yeah, that's beautiful. And Andy, you have a really wonderful closing statement that you sometimes use at the end of your consults. Well, I often say to patients that I know you can get better. I don't know exactly how you can get better, but I'll give you suggestions of things to try and you let me know how it goes. And I've had so many patients over the years come back to me and say, the most important thing you did is that you're the only doctor I saw who told me I could get better. And it makes me sad to hear that, that so few doctors let patients think that they can get better. But this is what I've seen again and again, is that many patients get better. And by the way, that woman with MS, my response to that was to burst out laughing and tell her <laughs> that I'd seen so many cases where MS goes into remission mm -hmm. and really nobody can predict the course of it. It sounds like that was a really great way to burst that hex with yes. laughter. <laughs> right. Um, so I think we have this all over medicine. Like one of the things I've thought about is the phrase that we used to use for when someone had a very indolent prostate cancer. We used to say watchful waiting. And that sounds okay, but it really what it implied to the patient, I think, was that we were waiting for it to get worse. Whereas active surveillance to me is a so much more positive term that we're actively, as uh, their healthcare providers, we're keeping a watch on who they are and how they're doing. Uh, but maybe there's a better term yet that implies that they will continue to have an indolent course of prostate cancer. We know that many men die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer, and that we could um, suggest to them that that will be the case. We have uh, terms like that scattered throughout medicine. The worst mm -hmm. or the most prevalent, in my view, is uh, cr the term chronic. Mm -hmm. uh, a chronic illness to anyone implies that there isn't and ever will be cure. And there's that fallacy of prophecy. How can, how can you know there never will be? And mm -hmm. how in that one individual patient can you know that their intrinsic healing capacities won't suddenly arise and extinguish it like, like this patient Andy's talking about with MS? You, you can't possibly know that. So even that word to me mm -hmm. is uh, implicit curse. And we really do need to inspect closely uh, the language that we use. It won't happen until we realize that ideas have an impact on health and healing. And we have a, a scientific underpinning to clinical medicine now that ignores utterly the impact of ideas on everything. Isn't it astonishing that there is no teaching on the power of words in medical training? I mean, it seems to me that should be a required subject. We may not realize it, but our labels inhibit us from recognizing that. We call one thing placebo, and we call another thing nocebo, and yet another thing hypnosis, and another thing distraction technique, and and without realizing that what's happening here, this is a communication continuum, mm -hmm. and that the underlying drivers of ideas producing effects are the same, and that it's the ideas and how we vary them that make for different effects. And our labels kind of shutter us off from recognizing that and allow us to go ahead with our material uh, science willy-nilly, just as if, as if the Petri dish is the person. Yeah, I think this also uh, very much 
points out the power of the mind body relationship and you know what people hear and uh, i've certainly um heard stories about people hearing things when they were unconscious because they were having surgery you know you hear some terrible things that um someone in the uh, operating theater might say like um this person will never heal and then that person hears that uh so i i do think that um the mind-body connection is completely undervalued in medicine. And that's one of the things we're trying to tra change in our integrative medicine training. Right. Well, think of the flip of that. If what you're saying is true, and it is, think of the flip. You know, one of the things I teach is, is, teach is that when the patient is uh, helpless and dependent, and you're the one least uncertain, you're the authority, you have hypnotic influence. Now, where in medicine, going going to your example, Victoria, where in medicine is that just absolutely perfect? It's in that moment just prior to surgery, just prior to mm -hmm. administering the pre-op sedative, mm -hmm. where the anesthesiologist turns to the patient and says, I'm going to give you this drug and take over all your bodily functions. <laughs> That's maximum authority. And imagine this, imagine if he, instead of quick pushing the Versed and dropping them into their unconsciousness, he pushed it slowly and said, and isn't it nice to know, you'll keep your own blood every drop <laughs> yeah. with delightfully surprising comfort so that even when you hear the word pain, how's your pain? Do you want a pain medicine on a scale from one to 10? How much pain? The word pain will be a trigger to feel even more comfort and really rapid wound healing. And then he pushes the last dose and they drop off. Years ago, I had a friend who asked me to accompany her to surgery. And she had a statement that she wanted me to read as she was coming out of anesthesia. So suggestible. And it was, I will only eat when I'm hungry and I will stop easily when my body is satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a very clever use of that very suggestible moment uh, to induce a healing response of another kind. Victoria, I was quite pleased. I think I told you this, that uh, one of our recent fellowship graduates who's an anesthesiologist is interested in working on an Oxford uh, University Press volume on integrative anesthesiology. And we have another graduate who's in, into this field also. I never even thought about integrative anesthesiology, but how great that would be. I completely agree. People are always asking you about the potential for psychedelics to induce healing. But it seems from what Steve is saying that maybe there is this other moment where messages that could uh, trigger a healing response uh, are appropriate. We, we know that psychedelics offer a, a lot. Um, but one thing they do in, in the clinical setting, the way they're being used and experimented with, is they recreate the situation I just described, whereby the patient, especially on their first trip, feels really maximally he helpless and dependent. And the trip master, the uh, physician or guide, whoever it is, is the one least uncertain how to get you through it. And so they, again, have this tremendous hypnotic influence and their words and their ideas matter. And so to me, it's just another example of the sort of everyday circumstance a physician finds himself with when he's face to face with a patient. Yeah. Now, I interrupted you earlier. You are going to teach a much better way of offering informed consent. And I think you do that so beautifully. And I do want to say for our listeners who are on audio, you're going to miss some interesting hand positions. But uh, if you have a chance, maybe turn on the video, at least for this piece. A little hand jive. Um, <laughs> okay, well, uh, for your listeners, let me remind them that if they're not hearing informed consent coming at them the way I'm about, about to describe it, it's very useful to say to yourself, because this is true, of the doctor who's giving informed consent or whoever it is, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me. That mantra will protect you if they accidentally 
misspeak. But <clears throat> the way to give the information is to realize that you don't, you, you really don't know the individual. You know some people who were in the sample or some people who you've experienced anecdotally and some patients. And so you put the sum off, I'll back up here, off away from the patient. I indicate that with my right hand palm up away from the patient. And I'll say, for example, um, well, let's consider the risks and benefits. Let's say it's a antibiotic and I'll, I'm gonna abbreviate this. Um, some people taking this medicine might have uh, a reaction to the light. Others, I'm not saying you here, others could have uh, nausea or vomiting, yet others might have diarrhea. Some could, others might like that. I, and I can give that information and give the statistics if, if necessary. But that's all put off to the side, directed away from the patient with that important um, referential index linguists call uh, some people, others, them, basically. And then when it comes to benefits, I'll turn with my palm up uh, indicating toward them, my eyes directly at them, my voice perhaps a little stronger. I'll say, on the other hand, I have patients perhaps very much like you. Now, I want to say perhaps, because this whole thing has to be done with honesty, but this is more honest than doing it the traditional way, you, 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 you. Some people, perhaps like you, who benefit quickly from this without in, any side effects, and in fact, become well within a few days. So I, I need to advise you to continue the antibiotic for its full course. I usually send people off, whether it's for this or something else with the, my final send off is, and you're not opposed to surprising yourself or pleasantly surprising yourself, are you? So I've implanted that um, delightful surprise suggestion as my uh, goodbye. But the informed consent is risks over there, some people, others, some patients. And perhaps you here with the benefits, you know, uneventful, good outcome and so forth. Don't be opposed to surprising yourself. Let me know how well you are tomorrow or the next day. It's such a beautiful way of offering informed consent. I will tell you, I was at a conference recently. It was uh, for internal medicine docs and I um, described offering informed consent for chemotherapy in this way. And one person in the end during the Q&A raised her hand and said, but is it ethical to give informed consent this way? And I said to her, you know, you have to find your own integrity with your language. And isn't it interesting that we have been acculturated in medicine to think that we have to put forward the most negative? It wasn't like I wasn't giving the example of the risks and the benefits, but I was suggesting that the patient would have a good outcome. And this physician was uncomfortable because of her training. And I just think that medical acculturation, which is perhaps to emphasize the negative. Andy, what do you think about that? Well, I've written about that. And my sense is that the training of physicians exposes them to more negative outcomes than positive. If you look mm -hmm. at the total spectrum of illness, the majority of conditions get better on their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, by far. But, but in hospital training, particularly, uh, residents, interns are exposed to very extreme cases of illness where positive outcomes are much less likely. So I think that's one, one reason why they are predisposed to predict negative outcomes. Another is that I think it increases a sense of control. You know, if you predict a negative outcome and it happens, then you, you know, you have predicted that and you're right. But if, if there's a uh, a positive outcome, uh, you can be su pleasantly surprised. I think that predicting negative outcomes gives physicians a sense of greater control. And I want to ask Steve a question. Uh, another aspect of this is that our society projects onto physicians the kind of belief and power 
that is projected onto priests and shamans in traditional cultures. I think most doctors are completely unaware of that and unprepared to use that projected power in the service of healing. And I think that's very crucial to make people aware of that. And I know, Steve, this is something you've written about, how the authority uh, and projected belief onto a doctor really interacts with the suggestibility of patients. So that for, for many patients, even just walking into a doctor's office is, is the beginning of a trance experience and leaves them very vulnerable to suggestion. Right. The, uh, the, this is the whole notion of authority. And I actually use your uh, phrase. I think this was from your book, Spontaneous Healing. Uh, I, I tell people when you put on a white coat and stethoscope, you have donned the raiments of the <laughs> high priest of medical technology. That's your phrase. Yeah. Um, but it's true. And with that comes, uh, as I'm saying this, uh, hypnotic influence where every word, every gesture, perhaps every thought even matters because you have these micro expressions that convey those thoughts. And so um, we're not taught that. In fact, we're taught the exact opposite, uh, which is material science, ideas don't matter, ideas are epiphenomena at best, and they they don't count in medicine. The, the argument to that is and and I think this is one of the greatest uh, deficiencies in medical education. The argument to that is that the single most established fact in medicine, proven in every single randomized controlled placebo controlled study, is that ideas do matter. The placebo is not the sham surgery or the sugar pill. It's the idea that if you do this, then you will get these various effects. And if instead of reading the um, primary, secondary outcomes of the study, you read those same studies asking this one question, do ideas matter? Does the pl implicit placebo suggestion uh, have force? Every single study since 1949 to today mm -hmm. will affirm and reaffirm and yet again, reaffirm that yes ideas matter and to me and 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 i owe you in in, in part for this because really uh health and healing put me on this road but to me this is the cardinal fact of medicine and it should be the first lecture everyone gets in medical school and the question then is and and it's a question i think we all should ponder and delight in is how the hell does this work if you take this pill, if you undergo this procedure, if you X, then the following things will happen. And given the, the precondition of their helplessness and dependency and your certainty about how to get them to the promised land, things will happen within their body. Their intrinsic healing capacities will kick in and do things that are miraculous, wondrous just the marvels of individual healing. And we never teach that. One of the things I often hear from patients is that they did so well and their doctor remarked about how well they were doing, but had no curiosity about yeah. what led to that really great outcome. Yeah. Well, a lot of people get stuck in their own box. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I teach that the placebo response is the greatest ally you have mm -hmm. as a physician. And the goal of medicine should be to produce the maximum healing response with the minimum intervention as called for by the circumstances of illness. Right. If we didn't call it placebo and we didn't right. push it from nocebo, but we just said, like, uh, elicit the intrinsic healing. Healing, yes. We would get a lot farther. Uh, it's it's these labels are opaque and they really don't allow us to see through to what's going on. Your statement of that you expect that someone can do well, recover, uh, heal is uh, a statement of expecting uh, that their intrinsic healing system will turn on and be effective. 
And it's not giving people false hope because right. my experience, both in my own body and in my, you know, observations of people is that most conditions get better. Uh, right. You know, there's a famous adage in medicine that the business of the physician is to distract the patient while time heals the problem. Right, right. Um, Steve, you have a wonderful question that you like to pose to all of your patients that gets to um, their sense of why they have become ill or injured themselves or or something else. Can you share that question? I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh I'd like, can I give it a little uh, ramp? Absolutely. Uh, no one has to believe what we're talking about. Uh, all they have to do is ask this question of people who get sick. Uh, there's a particular way you have to ask it, and I'll show you that. But if you ask this question of, of people who come in with illnesses, or even of yourself, and, and allow for a moment of brutal honesty, um, you'll realize over time that uh, ideas matter and that, in fact, errant ideas uh, can contribute, if, if not cause themselves, bad things to happen within the body. So I was an emergency room physician at the time. I, I hatched this idea. I couldn't wait to go in and ask. <laughs> and I was shocked, and I, I continue to be shocked daily at uh, the answer. Here's the question. Somebody's ill with something. Could have happened a day ago or two days ago. Could have happened a, a week from now or two weeks. Why today? Why now? And I don't want them to think about it because I'm not asking for their thoughts there. I want them to guess. Just guess. Just as an important word. And it means and nothing else. Don't think. Don't reason. Just guess. Why today? Just guess. And what you're doing with that question is you're evoking, you know, a whisper from the unconscious. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the unconscious causes or, or, or cause? So it, it, the first guy I did this to had uh, epididymitis uh, just above the testicle, little or organ had become inflamed. I didn't know why I treated him appropriately, gave him a referral, <clears throat> but I, I had thought of this question um the night before and as i was leaving just casually i turned around and i said to him this may not be important but i'm just curious trying to disarm his consciousness mm -hmm. just kind of curious um you know you could have had this a week or two ago uh you're not going to know and i'm not going to know let's not pretend but if you had to guess um why did they uh, why did they just just guess? And they all say the same thing at first. They said, well, I don't know. You're the doctor. You tell me. <laughs> and I said, well, you're right. I'm the doctor. But like I said, I, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know. And I know you don't. Know. Just guess. And that's when the, the, when the moment comes. You have to zip your lips. <laughs> wait. The silence as it percolates up. And he's buckling his uh, you know, belt and getting things. And at the very end, it frequently comes, the answer comes often as a question. He turns around and he says, yeah, I don't know, doc, but do you think this is going to interfere with the vasectomy my wife? <laughs> <laughs> and you, you cannot doubt the contributory effect of uh, ideas, and in particular, what I call baleful wishes, the wish to get out of something. Yeah. We uh, ask a similar but different question in integrative medicine practice, which is, um, do you have any intuition about what you might need to do to get well? Right. And again, you're you're asking them to guess, not to have like the doctor's expertise or to think through it, but to guess, oh, I, you know, do you think I need to quit my job? You know, whatever it is. It's very interesting what shows up for people. Yeah, that's beautiful. What we're, we're talking about is something that uh, we deal with on a daily basis. We have uh, constant confirming experiences. And I, and I suspect many in your uh, audience just being aware of themselves and their environment do too. 
but we live in this world of uh, almost a religious belief in, in science or scientism. And um, I wonder if you guys are well connected to institutions and you have uh, multiple resources, I wonder if it isn't time to really go after and develop uh, evidentiary base so that this becomes incontrovertible and um, arrives at its rightful place as the centerpiece mm -hmm. of, of medicine. Steve, I think the big problem is that what we're up against, it, it is a religious belief in scientific materialism. And right. that paradigm says that all that is real is that which is physical, can be touched, measured, and that a if you observe a change in a physical system, the cause has to be physical. Non-physical causation of physical events is not allowed for in that paradigm. And that's very upsetting to the, the priests of scientific materialism. You know, that's the challenge. And I think there is evidence accumulating. You know, the, the development of uh, functional MRI has mm -hmm. made the reality of placebo responses clear to some people. Uh, our ability now to show that meditation produces physical changes in the brain. I mean, there is an accumulating body of evidence, but it still is not enough to change that reigning paradigm. We are definitely trying to do that in our center. And we have provoked some very sharp criticism from, you know, some of the scientific materialists for what we're doing, but that has to happen. I'm, things have to go in that direction. And I'm, I'm confident that time is on our side. And one of the ways, of course, that we are also changing the system is by training uh, fellows and medical students and residents. And we so appreciate you coming yeah. and sharing this body of knowledge and helping to educate them in the art of language and the importance of every word. Every word matters. So thank you so much, Steve, for your uh, body of work. And uh, thank you for being on Body of Wonder. Thanks right back to you.